Good evening, everyone. Librarian Danielle Binashi here from the Cote St. Luke Public Library joining you virtually. Today, we have another great program for you. The library is thrilled to host a conversation with the best-selling author of historical fiction, Genevieve Graham. Thank you very much, Genevieve, for taking the time to speak with me today from, I believe you're in Halifax, or has that changed? Well, I'm on the road right now, so I'm not in Halifax at the moment. <laughs> okay, perfect. And thank you also, a big thank you to Mackenzie at Simon & Schuster for making this event possible. Thank you also to Andreas at Paragraph Bookstore for collaborating with us on the event. So to begin with, I will share a condensed bio. Genevieve Graham is the USA Today and number one best-selling author of The Forgotten Home Child, Letters Across the Sea, Tides of Honor, Promises to Keep, Come From Away, and At the Mountain's Edge. Her latest novel, Bluebird, has just been published earlier this month. She is passionate about breathing life back into Canadian history through tales of love and adventure. She currently is on the road. <laughs> uh, visit her at genevievegraham.com or on Twitter and Instagram at Jen Graham Author. Welcome, Genevieve. Thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations. Thank you. On a captivating and moving novel. So before we even begin discussing your latest novel, Bluebird, could you please share with our audience how you got into writing? Sure. I have kind of a weird story when it comes to writing because I, I'm not typical. I never, ever expected to be a writer. Um, I came out of being a reader. But um, I, when I was a stay-at-home mom, after having done a whole bunch of different jobs, my mom appeared one day with a book and said, it's time for you to get back to something that you love. And she handed me a book of the book Outlander, which got me into historical fiction. And I read everything I could. And then I finally, I told my husband, you know, I think I could do this. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of um, help from so many people in different communities. I was on different writers' websites where we helped each other. Um, and, uh, I, but I never, I've never taken a course on writing. I've never done anything like that. So I just, I don't know. I don't know how it started. I just, I dropped into it and I fell in love and I can't stop. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing. I read that you graduated from the University of Toronto with a bachelor in music, worked in marketing, advertising, and fundraising before becoming a stay-at-home mom. What was that like? And did these skills help you later down the line when your focus shifted to historical fiction with an emphasis on Canadian history? Well, I think that um, I think that coming from music definitely influences what I do with the creativity and, and knowing when I can express myself fully. It's the same thing with music. If you're sitting there and you're, you have to play normal along with everybody else and all of a sudden you can feel the emotion and, and you can really get into it. And that's how it feels to me with writing is really letting myself go into it. Um, the other jobs basically, I think they were supposed to teach me how to be organized and uh, didn't, didn't work, but I think they were supposed to be. Um, and uh, staying at home with my kids, my two beautiful daughters who are now both graduates from Dalhousie University. Um, nice. I think uh, they taught me everything I ever needed to know. Um, and as far as starting to write Canadian history, um, I should mention, you, you said I'm from the University of Toronto. So I did grow up in Toronto. And then I met my husband in Banff on a holiday in 1992. Uh, I met him in the chairlift lineup. And, and we lived in Calgary for 18 years. And then we came to Halifax in 2008. And at that point, I was not a published author. I was trying to write, I was, I was learning, um, but I had not been published anywhere. And uh, getting settled in Halifax, or actually I was on the Eastern shore, which was about an hour outside of Halifax. Um, I, I found myself surrounded by history. Like I'd never seen it before. Um, up and down the roads from me, there were 100-year-old houses and 
there were graves, um, cemeteries filled with graves from all over the place, like from different generations of the same family, which captivated me, but also pe people from the Titanic and the Halifax mm -hmm. explosion. And I had never heard of the Halifax explosion, which shocked and horrified most of my Nova Scotian friends. Um, but that's <laughs> where I started with my Canadian history. I will admit that I, I slept through history all through high school. I was just not interested in, in learning about the War of 1812 or the fur trade or planes mm -hmm. of Asia. You know, I, to me, it was dry words and dates and names that I memorized for tests and it, it meant nothing to me. So when I started digging into the Halifax explosion before I wrote Tides of Honor, that's when I, I realized that uh, it was everything I thought about Canadian history in that I believed it was boring and there was nothing to it and we should probably be studying somebody else's history instead. That was all wrong because Canadian history is fantastic. There are so many stories and I feel incredibly lucky that I fell into this genre and I discovered this hole where I could really dig and find these treasures. Um, I, I mean, uh, Bluebird is my seventh Canadian historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And I have two more on the go right now. So the stories are just always coming. Very nice. So for those listening in, I am going to share a synopsis of the plot. Present day, Cassie Simmons, a museum curator, is enthusiastic about solving mysteries from the past as she has a personal interest in the history of the rum runners who ferried illegal booze across the Detroit River during Prohibition. So when a cache of whiskey labeled Bailey's Brothers Best is unearthed during a local home renovation, Cassie hopes to find the answers she's been searching for about the legendary family of bootleggers. 1917, Corporal Jeremiah Bailey of the First Canadian Tunneling Company is tasked with planting mines in the tunnels beneath enemy trenches. After Jerry is badly wounded in an explosion, he finds himself in a Belgium field hospital under the care of Adèle Savard, one of Canada's nursing sisters, who's not really a sister, nicknamed Bluebirds for their blue gowns and white caps. As Jerry recovers, he forms a strong connection with Adèle, who is from a place near his hometown of Windsor along the Detroit River. In the midst of war, she's a welcome reminder of home, and when Jerry is sent back to the front, he can only hope that he'll see his Bluebird again. By war's end, both Jerry and Adele return home to Windsor, scarred by the horrors of what they endured overseas. When they cross paths one day, they have a chance to start over. But the city is in the grip of prohibition, which brings exciting opportunities as well as new dangerous conflicts that threaten to destroy everything they have fought for. Pulled from the pages of history, Bluebird is a compelling, luminous novel about the strength of the human spirit, and the power of love to call us home. So first, I noticed a news story in 2020 about a couple in upstate New York who found dozens of whiskey bottles uh, dating back to the 1920s hidden in their walls and floorboards, all but confirming their suspicions that the old home once belonged to a prohibition era bootlegger. Uh, did you use this story as an, uh, as an inspiration for this portion of the novel? I sure did. I didn't know anybody else but me had read it because I've <laughs> been asking me about it, about where the inspiration came from for the for the present tense part of the story. And I I have been telling them, if you go on Instagram, they're called um, Bootlegger Bungalow. And yeah, <laughs> fantastic story because um, they, the couple bought a home, uh, an old home, over 100 years old, built by a rum runner um, in in the rural New York. And uh, they, they started to renovate. They, uh, they do the quirkiest things. If you go to <laughs> them, they, ha they have amazing taste. It's so funny. But they were doing repairs on the old house to start with. And uh, when, when the New York Post caught up, it was the New York Post, I think, wasn't it? I think so. Um, I think so. Yeah, and when they when they caught up to them, they had been pulling off the rotten skirt boards on the outside. And as they pulled them off, they uncovered all these hundred year old whiskey bottles. And the really cool thing for me was that they also found some under the floor 
and they weren't sure what to do at first, but then they realized that these things were, they were beautiful the way they were. They were um, talking about the history and it was like living history. So they put a see-through floor over top of it so that they could always see those bottles buried beneath. But yeah, I thought that was a perfect way. I don't always write dual timelines and unless it really makes sense to do it. Um, I love writing about history. And so if I, if I just write the history, I'm happy. But running across this story, it was a definite sign <laughs> to tell the present tense story of it. And uh, I, I sent them a book. I'm, I'm waiting to see what they thought. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Two other fascinating topics in this novel, at least to me, uh, were the realities and dangers faced by tunnelers in the First World War, as well as the incredible risks and conditions faced by the nurses who signed on to help on the war front and were affectionately known as bluebirds because of their blue uniforms and white veils. Can you tell us a bit more about each? So much to talk about there. Um, <laughs> well, the tunnelers, that came to me as a complete surprise and I'm so glad it did, but I, I'll give you a little bit of background into why I wrote the book to start with. Um, it started off when I came to Nova Scotia, everybody pretty much said to me, you have to write about prohibition because my great uncle was involved or somebody else's aunt was involved or something. Everybody in Nova Scotia <laughs> knows somebody who was involved. Um, but I, I put it off and I put it off and I, I didn't write it right away. But then recently I became obsessed with a specific television show called Peaky Blinders. And uh, I've, I can't stop watching that show, I'm waiting for <laughs> But um, that's when I learned about tunnelers because the main character in that show, Tommy Shelby, was a tunneler. I'd never heard of that before. Never heard of that. So these men would actually dig down up, up to 100 feet below ground and dig underneath the trenches and plant camouflage, uh, the, the explosives that they needed to blow up the trenches. And they did amazing work. And yet we never, we don't know who they were. No never ever talk about them most of them were actually from mining they had turned the miner uh, they come from mining um i took a little creative license there and and let jeremy and uh, and his brother john do something else um but I, I loved including the tunnelers because i'm always looking for something unknown something that um that i've never read about before because the real reason i write these books is to educate me i need learn the truth about these things. So that's why I do the research. That's why you can count on the research to be correct because if it wasn't, I'd just be fooling myself. So learning about the tunnelers was, that was so great because I know a lot about World War I, but I'd never heard about these guys. And then I went over to the Bluebirds and there's so many stories of women during the war times that are not talked about. The only job that Canadian women could do um, overseas as part of the war was as a nursing sister. Um, they started out as sisters. They weren't always sisters because um, they ran out of them. They needed more and more nurses. Um, in the end, there were almost 3,000 of them that, that served over there. Um, the nurses were there for medical reasons, obviously, but they were also known for their compassion. And the men in their care thought of them as angels of mercy. And, and they, they grew very fond of each other as friends. And I know that there were connections made beyond friendship, but um, mostly they were supposed to stay separate from their charges. Um, the, the blue gown that they wear, the robin's egg blue, which is very pretty, mm -hmm. um, with a little white apron over top, um, it was distinct in that the nurses from the U.S. and the U.K. wore gray dresses. And from what I read, there was a little bit of envy on their part <laughs> of our pretty blue dresses. So um, it was kind of, uh, inter it was interesting learning about the bluebirds. But when I tried to, at the end of it, I started to look for um, personal stories, journals and letters and um, even poetry or photos from some of these nurses. It was almost impossible to find them. It's interesting, you know, you, you can find journals of men all over the place, but it's very, very hard to find them from these women. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I, I wonder if it's maybe they felt like they'd been holding these secrets for the men all this time and they weren't gonna share them. I don't know what it was, but they were amazingly um, courageous women. Uh, nobody yes. 
we're going to get into. And these women just, they were, they were amazing. Uh, a few of them won medals of honor, nine of them actually. I did talk about two of them. I changed the names, but I talked about two of them in my book. It's amazing heroes. Yes, agreed. I enjoyed the dual timeline in this novel and loved the way that you were able to weave uh, both stories together. How did you approach this method? Was it by writing each story and then finding ways to connect them? Or did you write both simultaneously and then just hope that somehow they would cross paths? Well, that's sort of, that's sort of what people would think <laughs> for me because I am really disorganized. It, it never should be that way in the final draft, but I really am disorganized. No, I learned how to do a dual timeline from my editor back in 2019 or so when I wrote The Forgotten Home Child. Uh, that one, I, it was very important to me that I have two distinct stories that came together, but I, I kept messing it up. I kept doing what you said, the, the latter part and writing them all over and trying to figure out how I was gonna get them together. But really the way I've learned to do it is to write them as two separate stories. Um, always keeping in mind that by the end, I'm gonna to have to weave them back together somehow. And it's, it is easier to do it that way. And then as you are working on the second story, you can always drop little hints in the first story or vice versa. And uh, it helps to pull them together in the end. And when you write the two stories, do you write the stories? Do you kind of illustrate or map them out? Um, so there's either pantsers or plotters in the world. Okay. And, and uh, as you probably know, pantsers, they write by the seat of their pants while the plotters. <laughs> and I am a very, um, I'm a pantser that would love to be a plotter. I'm trying more and more to organize my thoughts, my plans. Um, basically, I just barge right in there. When I, when I start to write a book, I think of the main, um, the main concept of what I want to learn. I think of that as a black and white photograph. And I'll go into the library and take out every book I can find <laughs> About that, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, read through everything. And as I do that, that black and white photo is starting to pick up details. And I think of it as colorizing that photo. And so as I see the colors come in, I start to understand more and more about the details of the everyday life of these people. And as I do that, I start to see the characters. They start to come to life and they start to tell the story. And, and I find it at that point, it gets very... Uh, it gets very weird really because they talk to me and they tell me what I need to research next. So um, because I'm not tremendously organized, I do end up writing and researching probably way more than I need to, but I just, I love what I do. I love being able to dig into this amazing world and then recreate it. So um, it doesn't really matter to me if I overdo it because I enjoy the ride. Perfect. Uh, which kind of segues into my next question. A large portion of this novel has been attributed to what I can only imagine must have been hours upon hours of research. How did you approach, approach researching bluebirds, tunnelers, rum runners, and headline news stories all for the same novel? <laughs> um, well, that's sort of the name of the game. I have no choice but to do all that. Um, it is because just like when I wanted to learn about the Halifax explosion, I started off wanting to know about the bluebirds. That was my first thing. I wanted to know who they were. And I did, as I said, I went in and, and got my black and white photos starting to colorize with as many details as I could, um, which brings the characters to life. And I do it from, after I finished my library, I just read everything I can find. Then I'm online and I, find amazing luck with finding people that, well, sometimes I can go and seek out reenactor groups. They are very passionate about their work, but there are also people who specialize in very specific areas um, that are very willing to help out. Um, for example, for, the, for Bluebird, I at one point needed to find out how Jerry and John were going to walk around the dark without a lamp. And I found a website entirely dedicated to the history of flashlights. So there's there's an expert out there for everything. <laughs> it's uh, it just grows and grows what I need to learn about because uh, if you can envision, say, Adele walking down a street, 
I have to see what she sees in order to make it feel genuine. And so I need to know what those streets look like, you know, what the vehicles look like, the store windows. If she stops and looks inside one of those store windows, I need to know what's there, um, what she needs those things for, how she'd use them and how much they cost. So um, it's just, it's sort of, she shows me what I need to learn about. Same with the tunnelers. And with the tunnelers, I came across um, a movie actually, I believe it was called The War Below. Um, and it's, it wasn't shown in theaters, but I, I'm not sure how I got on a mailing list, but I got to watch it. Absolutely incredible history that, like so many other things that I've that I've realized as I as I research all my stories, there are so many stories that are not paid attention to, yes. that are not taught. And the tunnelers is, those men, uh, I mean, as bad as the trenches were, these guys were underneath the trenches. Um, and so the more I learned about them, the more I admired them. Um, and uh, it was just, it's pretty much that the research leads me around. Now, sometimes the, the research um, gets very personal. And my my best um, illustration of that is when I did the Forgotten Home Child. Because what I did was after researching the British Home Children Advocacy and Research Association, going through their website, I found their Facebook page. And on that page were thousands of descendants of the British home children. And so I started telling them what I wanted to do. And they they came to me with open arms. They filled in a survey for me um, about the British home children. And instead of a few responses, I had 200 within the first week. These people want to share. And so if you, you know, I, I didn't know if they would want to help me or not, but if I hadn't tried, I never would have had the book that I had. Um, it didn't happen so much with, with Bluebird that way, but I did reach out to various nurse organizations and, and dug into their history a little bit as well. Let's turn to the characters um, within the novel for a few moments. Adele was one of my favorite characters in the book. How did you go about writing her story and is it based on a real Bluebird? Um, well, one little section was the section where there's a fire in the hospital tent. I'm not going to give everything away here because <laughs> I for those who haven't read it yet. But there is a scene in which um, the the Clearance Center Hospital, which was a mobile hospital, sort of a, a village that they could move to to get closer or farther away from the front, um, and it, they did get attacked sometimes from above. Yes. And so I included a scene where they were bombed from above. And uh, in it, I talk about two nurses, but I let Adele be one of them um, that actually did go in there. And they had to um, put out all the coal heaters and they had to rescue the patients who, who were not mobile and get in there and do all that. They kept going back in and back in and back in. And the only way they stopped was because they, they were knocked unconscious by a falling beam. Um, and, and so for me, that gave me Adele, you know, learning what these women would do. Um, and while they're courageous, they're also women and they're also sensitive women. And to imagine what it's like to sit beside these men, many of whom died under their care, no matter what they did, they were going to die. And you think about the scars and the pain that that inflicts on those women. It just it spells out Adele for me. I could see her in all of those emotions, um, as well as her roommates. I could picture what the, what the girls had to go through and how they would um, build up a shield of sorts, um, toughen up so they could move on and live a, a life on their own afterwards. But boy, um, the men returning were not the only ones suffering from PTSD in the war. And which was your favorite character to write and why? I, okay, I don't know why, but I love <laughs> male characters. I love writing the leads and I loved writing Jerry. Um, I'll uh, little, little little secret out in that Jerry and John are named after my grandfather and his brother. So um, when I looked in uh, my ancestry, all of them started with J and uh, John Jeremiah and all sorts of things like that. So um, I, I loved writing those two, the brothers, but in particular, Jerry. And having sort of modeled him uh, against the, Tommy Shelby in Peaky Blinders, I could see him. I could really visualize how he was moving and how he was speaking. Um, I actually do watch a lot of 
these male actors to my husband, of course, thinks it's because I think they're handsome or something. <laughs> it's just researched and I just need to <laughs> visualize my characters better if I know you know how he would hold his head or how it, he would gesture and I can sort of carry that over into my book so I do love writing the men um, my first book Tides of Honor I had written only Danny Baker I'd never written about his wife Audrey and uh, when my first editor read it he said she said well who is Audrey? Because she has to be something really special if she's with Danny. And that's what opened my eyes to, oh yes, I should be writing a book too. Um, but it always ends up that it's the boys that I like to write. <laughs> and can you tell us more about Ernie's character in the book and how you came up with him and his multiple facets? So the easiest thing in the world um, to write is a caricature of a person. Um, I needed a bad guy, you know, and, and it's so easy to write a typical bad guy and, you know, he's, everyone hates him and, um, you know, you don't really have to go into it, but that's not how to create a genuine character. Everybody who, everybody in my story, I have to look at them that way and say, okay, uh, Ernie's got some issues and where are they coming from? And so I had to go back in his story and try to figure out what could have made him into the man he was. For anyone who hasn't read it, he was sort of, he was fictional, but he represented the uh, Al Capone type um, man that was running those towns. Um, Ernie was very damaged from his childhood and I had to really dig hard to figure out where that had come from. But if I hadn't, I don't think you would have believed in him as much. He needed to be, he needed a reason for, for being evil. And uh, I, it was pretty extreme, I think, that it, it went yes. well. <laughs> he needed that layering, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. Yes. In this novel, the bond between Adele and Jerry is at the center. Uh, but the bonds between siblings, especially between brothers Jerry and John, are also essential parts of the novel. Were these characters based on real people? Well, I think I think maybe you touched upon that earlier with uh, your family, your ancestors. Their names were, but really, really no. Um, and actually, if you think about it, it's also a story of, with siblings about Ernie and Frank. Yes. Willoughby. So the three pairs of siblings, and I did not base them on anybody. Um, I just needed um, each one of them has sort of another half. Like um, Adele has Marie as her sister, and I need a difference between the sisters. I need to, something that they struggle with to move forward. Um, and uh, they have to grow together or apart, as it may be. And uh, I really, it was interesting to me. I haven't really dug into siblings before, and I found it very interesting. The different dynamics, Jerry and John are inseparable. Um, and uh, I think so were Frank and Ernie. Yes. But it, we never found out the ending to that. So um, I find it very interesting to write that. But no, I didn't, I didn't accept for the names. And I, I will also tell you that Adele's name came from a reader who wrote to me at one point, and her name is Adele. And she had said, I know you've been thinking about writing about prohibition. I think you should look at the Windsor Detroit funnel, which actually was the busiest, um, the busiest port for bootlegging and rum running in the entire world. Um, right there. So I was very grateful for her, to her for pointing this out because as I said, I'm not a historian. So I'm looking for stories and when they come in that way and coming from a reader was very special. So uh, I named her after her. Very nice. Um, so this leads perfectly into my next question. I read that it has been estimated that 75% of alcohol consumed in America was transported on waterways between Windsor and Detroit during the Prohibition era, era, I'm sorry. And it seems as though Windsor, Ontario is still running rum running tours to this day. Uh, has your research involved booking a tour or visiting Windsor? Um, no, I have not. I, um, I was in Windsor a long, long time ago, but um, no, I'm not. I actually don't have a budget to go out and travel to places for research. I know a lot of authors do. Um, I imagine it would, I don't know if, it, I think it would make it 
come to life maybe more if I could, but I, I make do with it uh, with it here. But yeah, that was the, the amount of booze that went over there. Like in the first nine months, they shipped, what was it? 900,000 cases of whiskey from across the Detroit River. That was just amazing numbers, the things that these men did, and women too. Um, the, uh, the word bootlegger, I don't know if people realize it, uh, came about because they were trying to smuggle the booze out um, into the States or even in Canada because we had prohibition as well, although it was very different. But the prohibition in the U.S. was very, they didn't want us to come over, but we did. And uh, so bootlegging itself came from trying to hide some bottles in your boots and uh, running across there with with a bottle in there, there was, they had so many ways to uh, smuggle them. That was really entertaining to read those. I thought that was a really fun aspect of the novel for those who will be reading the novel soon, uh, were the creative ways that people thought of to conceal <laughs> the alcohol. Yes. So they could do, they could do anything on, in cars, in, in boats, on foot. Um, like the women would hide bottles in their in their brassieres. They would hide them in baby carriages. Um, there was a story of one gentleman who crossed the ice with a dozen eggs that had been blown out and filled with whiskey. Now, I'm not sure why someone would do that um, because that's not a lot of whiskey, but I kind of think that part of what they were doing, of course it was financial. The men were making so much money on this booze. But I think after a while, it just turned into a challenge. And how else can we get past them? And I think that's what that gentleman did. I, I love that story. But they had amazing um, techniques, like the boats. One of my favorites is how they would, they would string the, the bottles up on the outside of the boats as they went. And then if the authorities stopped them, if the American authorities came to stop them, they would cut the rope that tied them to the boat and they would sink to the bottom of, of the river. But they were also weighted down by a chunk of salt. And that salt would disintegrate and the bottles would come right back up and pick them up and sell them. And they were just ingenious. They did so many things um, in cars, they, they had them in the running boards, they had them in the gas tank, they had them everywhere. They, um, the, they, would, they would attach chains behind their cars sometimes so that when they spun, it would create such a dust cloud that the authorities would lose them. <laughs> they just do, it's, it was really fun. And there are some, um, I guess I shouldn't say fun because it was criminal, but it's fun to read about and uh, the same time as all this was happening, Al Capone was coming up in the world. Um, he, uh, he came a little bit later in the 20s, but he did come to Windsor. He was quoted as uh, when he was asked if he'd been here, he said something like, I don't even know what street Canada's on. So <laughs> not at all. Um, but there's a, it, for me, it was a lot of fun reading about that aspect of it. So earlier on, we talked a little bit about uh, the importance in the details, the devil is in the details, as they say. Um, and I heard you mention that you had something to say about cover and the little plane. Can oh, yeah. you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm learning all the time from the publishing experts. Um, I just write the book. So um, I don't know if people know this, but authors usually have very little say on their covers. So when Bluebird appeared in my email, that beautiful blue, I could not believe how gorgeous it was. And Simon & Schuster has always made it, made my covers incredible. They just suit the story so well. So I love this one. Um, it goes along with the historical fiction sort of category. They like to do the view from the back of the woman. And I believe that's seeing the future from her eyes or seeing the history from her eyes. But the interesting thing, what you're talking about is um, what I have learned along the way is that when you're reading a World War I or II book, and I'm sure it doesn't happen all the time, but I, I've seen it a few times. If you're reading about a World War I story, uh, there will be a biplane in the sky. And if it's World War II, it's a regular plane that's flying by there. So you can usually tell if it's one of those. Um, I'm, I'm the one responsible for throwing the little Model T onto the road there because he needed Very nice. 
Uh, the other question I had for you in the novel, without giving away too much, uh, there is a whiskey that's quite important. It's Bailey's Brothers Best. Um, is this an authentic uh, whiskey brand? No, but I, I love Bailey's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that was my little that was my little tip of the hat to Bailey's because I really enjoyed it. I needed a good uh, family name, and I thought, well, that's kind of fun if I can throw in something that I like and make it part of the story, and to have all the alliteration of of the bees, it all just worked perfectly well. <laughs> We've asked a few other um, invited authors who they would potentially like to see cast in a movie version of their book. Uh, would you have some ideas? Um, for this one, it would be the two actors, the two main actors from uh, from Peaky Blinders, Killian Murphy and, and the woman that played Grace. I thought they were absolutely perfect for it. Um, I haven't really thought too deeply on the other ones, but those two, I could see them clear as day. So I would, I'd have to have them. I'd have to just, I just write to them myself and say, I'm <laughs> my story. Very nice. Before I turn it over to the audience and let them ask you a few questions of their own, can you please share with us um, what your next project will be? Sure. Um, it's, I write a book a year, which is kind of crazy. Um, I actually wrote three books before I started on these ones. And so this is my 10th in 10 years, which is a little bit crazy. So I do have next year's um, on the go and the next one after that is planned. But next year's, um, I wanted to dig in. This is back to World War II this time. Um, and I've got, um, I want to dig into some of the stories of the women that we don't know about. And Part of the reason why we don't know about is that they had taken an oath of silence on pain of death. Um, one of the, I've got two sisters and one of them is a listener. So she would listen in for the Morse code and listening for the U-boats and trying to place them. And those were connected um, to Bletchley Park. So these listeners were very, very important to the war effort. Um, the other sister, she is a mechanic. She loves all things to fly. And she ends up joining the Air Transport Authority, which is another fascinating part of the war that we don't hear about. Um, these people would fly in the planes to replace um, downed or broken um, airplanes. They had to keep replacing them. And so uh, they started out with those with some of the World War I pilots. They brought them in. But they needed more as the war kept going. And so they brought in women. And there were a few Canadian women that flew with the, with the Air Transport Authority. And the ATA Air Transport Authority also meant that they were called Atta Girls. Um, there's one other section I'm going to be including in the book maybe two, but I know one for sure. And that is writing about Camp X. And Camp X is the spy school uh, in Toronto. And um, they actually did train spies um, and they trained uh, men and women to go and create resistance fighters. And um, it's, it's very exciting learning that these types of things started here. Uh, I believe it was right near Casa Loma in Toronto. And uh, they, it's, the, um, Ian Fleming was there, 007, and uh, a lot of, I guess, famous spies had been there. And I'm learning more and more about how they would have um, gone behind enemy lines. It's very fun. So somehow I'm going to tie them all together. It sounds fascinating. I'm sure everyone tuning in, uh, just as I am, are excited to read it. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I it see. It has sort of a name. We, we think it's going to be called The Secret Keepers. Very nice. Secret keepers. We'll keep an eye out. Uh, I see a question from the audience uh, from Andrew. Happy to hear you speak after listening to the prologue this morning. Do you watch TV's movies that also sprinkle in Canadian history? I'm thinking of Murdoch Mysteries, but assume there are others. Um, I do when I can find them. I watch, generally I watch, um, I love war movies. I love them. And my my husband is very happy that I love them because then he gets to enjoy them too. Um, I love digging into history and yeah, Murdoch Mysteries, a lot of the, a lot of, there's not a lot of stuff that was done here, sadly, and it should be. Um, so I, I watch things that are on YouTube that are Canadian stories. Um, for example, in Letters Across the Sea, I wrote about the Christie Pitts riot, 
have, having watched um, YouTube, Canadian YouTube stories told there, and also the Hong Kong, um, the Battle of Hong Kong POW prisoners, they have a YouTube documentary on there that's all Canadian. Um, those are my favorites to watch, but there just aren't enough, there aren't enough Canadian um, books or movies or anything being made, in my opinion. That's why you have to continue providing us these stories. My, my hope really is that these books would someday find their way into high schools across Canada. Yes. I feel that historical fiction makes the history more real. It brings it alive and you can really understand and appreciate what happened before we came along. And uh, I, I would love to see that, to see different classes like grade eight and up reading these books. So something else from the audience, from Debbie, I adore historical fiction and so appreciate you investigating Canadian stories. I thoroughly enjoy your books. Thanks so much for your wonderful effort. Thank you. Thank you. I feel very lucky doing what I do. Okay, and Andrew says thank you for your response as well. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for coming to listen to the uh, first chapter fun this morning. I was a Facebook group that uh, they read my first chapter this morning, which was fun to listen to. Uh, very nice. Uh, so something else, not, uh, not really a question, but I'm about halfway through and have come to your description of the labels on the bottles with a little symbol. It really grabbed me and made me smile. I love when you do these little touches from Probus Women's. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> Yeah, you have to look for the little nuggets and uh, yes, this makes it a little more special. Yeah. So I believe you had a special swag bag for this novel when it first came out. Can you tell us about that? Because it was beautifully curated. It was. I, uh, well, there were, there were two. Um, one of them was a pre-order sweepstakes that my publicity director um, ran and it was beautiful. I wished I yes. could have. And they had a, there was a print, a beautiful print of a bluebird. There was um, an actual, um, oh, what's the set that when they would make the martinis and the shakers and they, and they would make all the different drinks in those. Uh, I hope you, I hope you. Uh, de, was it decanter? I, it's that not the word? A, that they shake. Anyway. Okay. The shaker. <laughs> I um, can't find the word. <laughs> Um, there were a few things and it was very beautiful and I have not heard who won it yet, but it's, it's a good one. The other thing it, that's my publicity director, Mackenzie, who was fantastic, um, that she did um, just for a few of the influencers. Sometimes they send things out to just a few of the top um, reviewers so that they spread the word more, more than, you know, just regular. And what she did was she actually bought some small whiskey bottles. They looked like little whiskey bottles. And she had me write a personal note inside that bottle and then she sealed them all up and she sent them out with the book. So that was a, that was a neat little touch. And I think yeah. people said it, they really enjoyed that. I love that. Very, very creative. I'm sure uh, the people receive them, receiving that were happy to receive that as well. Mackenzie's done another thing too, and I'm hoping I, I'm going to start talking about it more. She has created a cocktail based on the on the books. It's called the Bluebird, and so I'm I'm going to have to post that again so that people can see it. So what would be in the Bluebird? Um, I remember <laughs> there is um, well, there's whiskey for sure, um, and there is uh, oh geez, I can't remember. I can't remember right now offhand. I know there's a maraschino cherry in there though. Um, it just, you know, you caught me on that one. I should have looked that up before I opened my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have. I'm just gonna ask you one last question because there are always some prospective uh, writers tuning in. Um, so what piece of advice or nugget will you, would you give them um, on their path to choosing writing full-time as a career? Uh, well, I think, um, wait, there's two different things there, writing and then writing as a career. Yeah. They're, they're different things. Yes. Um, and so writing, I, so, so many people come up to me and ask me, like they'll, they'll say, I've always wanted to write a book and they'll leave it at that. And I say, well, why haven't you? 
and they say there's there's a couple of different things and one is oh I just don't have time yeah. or what if I wrote something and nobody cared about it and I say neither one of those work because if you, you can always find five minutes a day and if you if you work at it every day you can transform your thinking and, and make new pathways that you can follow and five minutes a day will turn into 10 minutes a day and, and it just becomes therapeutic at least it does for me so the excuse about the time doesn't work um and for um the one about if you write it people might not want to read it that's not good either because you're writing for yourself and uh, it really doesn't matter and it's it's to get your creativity flowing you know, you could be writing a grocery list if you do it in a, in a creative way and you start thinking differently and letting yourself open up to these expressions. Um, you never know what will come from that. So um, as far as writing for a living, well, don't expect to get rich. I can tell you that. Um, it's a very, very competitive um, I found it extremely competitive to get to the stage where you need an agent, a literary agent. A lot of people don't get literary agents, they go to smaller publishers, but if you're going to the larger publishers, you need a, a literary agent most of the time. Um, and that part of it I found extremely tough, uh, extremely defeating. I wrote query letters to hundreds, it feels like, dozens anyway, of literary agents and got so many rejections back, just like Stephen King yeah. did. Just like Darling <laughs> did, they all got these, but yes. they, they hurt. And uh, you just stick with it if you believe in it. And you have to take um, suggestions. You have to be open to editing. Um, too many people are defensive. Um, these are our babies. And so we don't like anyone criticizing them, but there are ways to improve upon things. And so being open is really important. But just stick with it if you yes. are just right it's the best thing you can do for yourself and be perseverant I believe that when we had Stephanie Robble she told us a similar story where it was very difficult and she had many 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 rejections but she continued on yeah you just really have to I know I was sending out five a week for many 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 weeks and uh, most of the time you don't even hear back from them um, but when you do sometimes they'll give you a little nugget to help you improve your work and, and those are so so valuable um, now that i know how busy editors are in those publishing companies i really really appreciate when yes. they send me comments because they really don't have time to do that so um, it's very thoughtful of them so we had one last comment um, from Andrew uh, going back to the cocktail, which was Blue Gin from the Empress in Victoria. Oh, say that again. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, Andrew Be uh, Ball um, said Blue Gin from the Empress in Victoria. Ah. <laughs> well, I know there's, there's a couple of different things in it, but I don't have it in front of me, so I can't. You're probably right. But you know what, Andrew? I will post it on my Facebook page tomorrow morning. For tonight and then we can all see perfect we're excited to uh to find out what the recipe is yes thank you so much and for sharing your time with us and for telling uh everyone a little bit more about the book it was fantastic i loved it um and another thank you for including the general comment <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much um I really, I really love speaking to groups like yours, speaking to library people. Library people are the best people. And uh, um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Geneviève. Have a nice evening. Mm -hmm. Genevieve, thank you. <laughs> thank you.